I have watched all seven seasons, 68 episodes of Rick and Morty so far, and now I'm going to rank all the episodes from worst to best. Rick and Morty has always been one of the best animations I've ever seen, and I can go on and on about how innovative this show is. So I just made this video to share the love for the journey I've had with this amazing show. God, man, we were all 14 once, but it's called self-control. The Smiths band together to fight an army of giant mutant sperm, and let's just say everyone would be better off if Morty stays away from Beth's work. He creates sperm monsters that threaten the entire country. This felt like it was written between friends when really, really drunk. Rick need to be saved from the station wagon by the military? What? Did he need the military's nukes to take out the Grand Canyon base? He just sat watching while the Squeal Team 6 leader mapped out the plan for taking out the base, and he got taken out by a pack of sperm that got close enough to stab him and didn't notice. Worst episode ever. Can you boost me up so I can hook my belt to the ceiling fan? When Mr. Poopy Butthole overstays his welcome at the Smith household, the rest of the family gets Rick to deal with the problem. However, what starts out as a hangout among friends quickly turns into an out-of-control bar crawl, especially when a special guest joins the group. This episode is essentially written like a mediocre Simpsons celebrity special guest episode. There's no real story, just a pretext for some random events to unfold in a succession of short gags. Introduce a random Hollywood star to compensate for the boring story and proceed with another set of short gags. Then introduce some random TV reference and continue with yet another set of random short gags. In the end, it now resembles the cheap recipe of American Dad or Family Guy, but worse. President! President! Good, good, good! President Curtis starts bringing Rick's therapist, Dr. Wong, along on his missions, and it makes Rick wonder if Curtis might be interested in dating her. Meanwhile, an ex-lover of Rick's takes control of Virginia, leading to rising tensions and sparks of conflict. It's almost like there was a rule in place, maybe before this season, to avoid overusing characters from previous episodes. They used to carefully introduce cameos and jokes, ensuring they didn't go overboard. However, this season seems to be taking the opposite approach, leaning more towards fresh new ideas. Wong comes off as a challenging character, and President is being used a bit too frequently in a similar manner. However, it's Rick whose transformation remains unclear. There's a lack of menace or ruthlessness in his character, and he comes across as somewhat timid, which isn't as much fun to watch. His emotional involvement in relationships with Wong and the President feels unusual for the usually indifferent Rick we're used to seeing. Whoa, easy now, Naruto. Rick cancels a trip to Boob World to acquire the fifth and final Gotron Ferret. Summer enables Rick's addiction to collecting giant combining robots. It's the Voltron Goodfellas crossover with anime. The Mafia bit had potential, and the anime Voltron setup sounds like a good idea on paper. In execution, it fails completely. Nothing is being developed. The stories literally have no beginning, middle, and end. They just sort of happen. The saddest part of all of this is we're never going to see Boob World. The post credit scene was a 10, which is cooler than the episode itself. Open your mind! Rick gives Summer an attribute slider as payment for helping clean up his messes. When Morty wants it for himself, the siblings are thrown into an adventure where Morty becomes a Quato from Total Recall. The phrase, open your mind, was incredibly annoying. At times, there were actual Teen Titans Go jokes being thrown around, but sometimes Teen Titans Go is funny, and this was not one of those times. For instance, Quato Knife and the most meaningless Rick-respecting summer moment occurs when she reminds him of his wife. Wow, the cringe. <laughs> Beth crashes Rick and Jerry's hellish guy's night out, while Morty and Summer attempt to use a spaceship to impress a cool new kid at school. Jerry is so lame. He is torturing people just by being himself. This idea went nowhere. So Beth comes in and agrees with the demons, and we all thought something funny would happen because of it. But no, and Chud, um... Literally not a single funny line with him on screen. The ship had its moments and was the best part of the episode. The joke goes on for too long. When I turn into a turkey. Rick and Morty accidentally destroy several important historical artifacts, arousing the ire of the president. As Thanksgiving approaches, Rick decides to turn himself into a turkey to secure a sweet presidential pardon. However, 
It's not his first time doing this, and the president is prepared. A machine transforms him and some soldiers into turkeys as they await their arrival. When the wrong turkey is turned back into the president, a corrupt Congress quickly plunges the country into chaos under his wattle. It's a very weird episode, and a random subplot with the country guy and girl feels out of place. Rick and Morty seem to be relegated to background characters, which can work but doesn't quite in this case. The only enjoyable moment for me was the build-up when the turkey president started transforming turkeys into humans, building tension. But that lasted only a minute. And that's the end of the Morty Gets a Dragon episode. Morty requests a dragon from Rick, leading Rick to find a wizard from another dimension. The wizard creates a soul-bonding contract between Morty and a dragon named Balthromaw. Meanwhile, Jerry encounters a talking cat in his bedroom, who expresses a desire to fly to Florida. Unfortunately, this episode predominantly focuses on sexual humor, and the dragon subplot lacks sufficient intrigue. The only somewhat redeeming aspect is when they observe the cat's brain, which becomes memorable due to its meme-worthy nature. Morty, Summer, Daughter, Wife. While attempting to teach Jerry a lesson, Rick swaps their minds and bodies. However, things take a wrong turn, and their minds become entangled with each other. From attempting to kill each other to becoming best friends, they wreak havoc around the galaxy. Yet, not everything unfolds as planned, forcing them to make tough decisions between their newfound happiness and their family. The concept of Jerry's fusion with Rick was clever, transforming Rick into a more human figure, while Jerry relished in the newfound tools, intelligence, to navigate life. Both discovered their missing halves, bringing a sense of comfort to their respective misery. The narrative mostly revolves around them engaging in a series of heists, random running and shooting, concluding with an emotional turn that, unfortunately, didn't delve deep enough. The vast majority of space is empty. As Beth explores a bold new take on self-love during Thanksgiving, Morty and Summer find solace in playing a realistic video game. The episode revolves around Beth having an affair with Space Beth and unfolds over the Thanksgiving holiday. It takes on a more slice-of-life approach compared to other episodes, but the resolution felt rushed and lacked satisfaction. One aspect I enjoyed was the segment about the real game they were playing. The console looked intriguing, and the anticipation built around the real game hinted at something extraordinary, perhaps similar to interdimensional cable TV, or the Roy game where they would be sucked into or trapped in the game. However, the concept of a real game turned out to be a metaphor for real life, highlighting how mundane reality can be. Are you doing a die-hard? An off-world arcade falls victim to a terrorist attack, causing a power disruption that scatters Morty's consciousness across the millions of non-playable characters in the game he was playing. Rick steps in to persuade these entities of their true nature, but Morty, torn by doubt, struggles to decide whether to believe him. Meanwhile, Summer attempts to thwart the terrorists, led by an alien Hans Gruber, by enacting a die-hard scenario despite having never seen the film. The dialogue is distilled down to just repeating Die Hard over and over again. While both storylines, especially the five billion Mortys concept, had potential, they felt rushed and underdeveloped due to frequent cuts back to summer. Ultimately, the overarching plot and the Roy subplot are painfully predictable and generic. We understand genocide. We do it sometimes. Jerry is confronted with the challenging decision of sacrificing his manhood to save an alien leader from imminent death. Meanwhile, Rick, Morty, and Summer delve into the possibilities of interdimensional television. The Jerry storyline begins decently, but quickly becomes somewhat uncomfortable, dragging on and feeling somewhat tedious. The ending is also irritating. Although watching Jerry being brutally killed isn't the darkest thing Rick and Morty has done, it isn't a pleasant experience. Can't get nothing past the chicken bone lady. When Morty is offered a gift from a stranger, Rick advises him not to accept. However, Morty doesn't heed the advice and is drawn into a messy adventure, all part of an elaborate vat of acid joke. It was surprising when I gradually realized it. Initially, it was genuinely funny for me, but the humor waned as the episode progressed. It never reached a point where I found it less than good, but it didn't maintain the hit rate of its opening scene, making it not as good as it could have been. Your acid rain is an acid pain in the butt, Diesel Weasel. Morty falls in love with an ecological heroine named Planetina, and quickly encounters trouble with the people who created her. 
Meanwhile, Rick and Summer visit planets that are on the brink of extinction to have wild parties and escape their problems. The A plot briefly touches on global warming, breakups and the corporate manipulation of youthful celebrities, while the B plot focuses solely on, well, sex. That's it. The B plot is definitely the aspect I liked least about this episode. While it has a couple of good lines and jokes, it lacks the depth and self-awareness of the Planetina and Morty storyline. In this episode, Morty ends up killing Planetina's four kids in a fantastic scene that reminds me of Avatar, The Last Airbender. Previously on Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty find themselves ensnared in a perplexing, meta-powered loop of adventures, culminating in a showdown with an unmotivated nemesis. Describing the story of this episode is a bit challenging, as it's a whirlwind of characters appearing and disappearing. Nevertheless, it's clever, funny, well thought out, and amusing. This episode showcases the show's strength in delivering crazy plots and insane sci-fi sequences. While it might not be the most original episode, it remains thoroughly entertaining. I to talk. After Morty fathers a child with a sex robot, Rick and Summer visit the robot's planet, while the kid grows into an adult within days. This episode may be a bit too earnest for its own good, Morty's parenting is constantly judged by his parents and is not quite as funny as it could be. It sets up a lot for the Footloose parody, which I didn't find that funny, and the tell-all book, which, to be fair, I did. The female-centric society isn't well observed either, and we're back to an older model for Rick, where he's constantly burping and farting. I don't want to come off like I didn't like the episode. It's another brilliant one, but I find myself writing reviews to explain why it's not as good as others, rather than praising it in its own right. Planets only. Planets only. Jerry's plan to take the whole family on a camping trip is sidetracked when Rick gets news that he may have impregnated a planet. Rick's character is well written in the episode, exploring directions the series hasn't delved into much detail before. The episode is noticeably filler, but it introduces an interesting dynamic for its A-plot characters. However, the B-plot characters slow the episode down a bit, with some jokes and visual storytelling lacking weight. Despite being a one-off episode, it provides good development for Rick's relationship with Beth. Rick and Morty forever and forever hundred years, Rick and Morty some things. Pilot is the first episode of the first season of Rick and Morty. It marks the beginning of a fantastic show and serves as a great introduction. Typically, pilots can be rough as not everything is fully developed, but in this case, it's not a significant issue. Aside from a few aspects mentioned later, the plot is engaging, providing a solid introduction to the main cast of characters. While it's a great start, it may not be the greatest episode when compared to others. The first episode is notably weird, even for a show known for its eccentricity and messed up themes with Rick's mannerisms feeling a bit off. Overall, it's still a solid start. Dinosaurs are back! Monkeys went bald? This episode features dinosaurs returning to Earth, revealing that they left to help other planets. The dinosaur characters are enjoyable, and it's appreciated that Rick didn't immediately resort to killing them, instead seeking something wrong with their intentions. Although a meteor always follows the planets they visit, it's not their fault. The concept of dinosaurs returning after several millennia to try to help is cool, and the screaming meteorite adds a terrifying element. The side materials, such as Jerry's book and the Oscar hosting, have the potential to be interesting, but feel rushed to their conclusion serving as mere bits. Jesus, the tickets please guy is cut. He, he's, he's got those things. Rick and Morty get caught in a continuity creating anthology device filled with people telling stories about Rick. This episode condensed 90% of the teaser trailer into a single episode. The episode is weird and crazy, making it hard to pinpoint my feelings. It's humorous and the characters are as eccentric as ever. What intrigued and excited me the most was towards the end, when both Rick and Morty were hit by the machine, revealing potential canon events. We saw Rick and Summer fighting Phoenix Person and Tammy, and evil Morty leading an army against Rick and Morty. However, the significant challenge with this episode is that it can mostly be enjoyed by dedicated fans who understand Dan and Justin's writing style. Casual viewers might have a tough time comprehending the episode's events and finding the humor appealing. Show me 
what you got. In this episode, a giant head comes to Earth asking for an original song, leading to an American Idol like parody to judge the planet. This episode may not be as powerful as the rest of the Rick and Morty series, but it remains pretty good and interesting. I love it just as much as I love the series. It stands out as unique since it takes place on Earth in the normal dimension, unlike the others that involve interdimensional travels and communication with interdimensional creatures. The episode is certainly unpredictable, and the real treat is Ice-T. His appearance makes more sense by the end, and despite the crazy idea executed hilariously, he comes off as a sympathetic character in the end. Clean! Like a cocaine house! Dad, what's going on? In this episode, Rick and Beth address issues from her childhood by visiting a world called Fruppy Land, while Morty and Summer express wariness about Jerry's new girlfriend. The episode features two different and fascinating storylines. Beth revisits her childhood memories, highlighting her father's vacancy and poor Tommy, who must eat meat to survive. Jerry eventually falls in love, but with a hunter, causing a nuisance. It was somewhat confusing how halfway through the episode, they abandon Fruppy Land and delve into another plot, making the overall focus a bit unclear. Nonetheless, it remains creative, and the jokes, as always, add to the enjoyment. You dropped it perfectly vertical, Season Morty, six perfectly of Rick and Morty vertical. concludes with an episode that is perhaps the most balanced of the whole run. It's funny, features a reasonably clever sci-fi plot, provides more of the missing backstory, and resolves an online theory. Set during Christmas, the episode includes thoughtful gifts from Rick, including a working lightsaber from Morty. Unfortunately, Morty drops the weapon, cutting through several levels of Rick's underground lab and heading towards the Earth's core. The president arrives, offering Rick a chance to save the world. However, a truth is revealed as Rick and Morty argue. The recent Rick has been a robot, programmed to be nicer than the real Rick and to focus on hunting Rick Prime. While the president's character has become less appealing with each appearance, the Star Wars theme adds an enjoyable touch to the episode. Tum -tum, let's go! Grandpa's concern for your safety is fleeting! Amidst turmoil at home, Rick, Morty, and Summer embark on a journey to a post-apocalyptic world to violently work out some personal issues. The episode is primarily a parody of Mad Max, encompassing not just Fury Road, but the series as a whole. The references to the movie are appreciated, especially for fans of Mad Max. It's enjoyable to see Summer take on a significant role and showcase her strength. Rick's casual departure, leaving them behind with the expectation of a return, adds to the dynamic. However, the scene after the credits wasn't particularly noteworthy. Congratulations, you're officially the most successful businesswoman on Earth. At Panda Express, while the rest of the family get boring fortune cookie fortunes, Jerry says that he will engage in an intimate act with his mother. The rest of the family dismisses the prediction, though Jerry can't shake it, and convinces Rick to look into it. Rick discovers that indeed, Jerry's fate is questionable, so the pair head to the fortune cookie production plant, only to make a terrible discovery. The conclusion features an imaginative fight scene, indeed, the sort of scene that would only happen in Rick and Morty, as he battles an armed force who utilize and then are undone by the power of the fated fortune cookies. The mom joke almost went too far, but thankfully didn't. If nothing else, the concept here was very original. Hey look, Morty, I'm a leg. In this episode, Rick, Morty, and their families face an observer, a colossal space rock displaying clips of their past adventures, serving as a parody of clip shows. What makes this parody stand out is that it features entirely new footage each time, deviating from the typical mix of real and made-up clips. Surprisingly, the observer's demise leads to consequences for Rick and Morty, a twist I didn't anticipate. The comedic highlight was the revelation that they killed the versions of themselves that had cameos in Space Jam, a new legacy. The ant colony with the power of two human eyes. Rick and Morty are summoned by the Vindicators to stop World Ender, but end up in a death trap conceived by Drunk Rick. I love Marvel films, and I'm sure it was obvious that the Vindicators are just generic cliché superheroes like the Avengers. Seeing them both together was fun for me, especially watching them all die. Blackout Rick is awesome. He takes out the Vindicator's arch nemesis while so drunk that he can't even remember doing it or laying any of the traps. He even refers to Blackout Rick in the third person because he has no idea what kind of things he could have done while that drunk. 
It could literally be anything. Seeing Rick being this drunk was just great for me. All is Glorzo. The episode starts with Rick and Morty having face huggers that come off their faces. They try to retrace their steps and find out how they got into this situation. They managed to escape, but forgot they left Summer behind. The funniest part was probably the bit with Pearl Harbor. I was wondering if they'd come back to that. I guess I'm glad they didn't. Summer recounts their adventure, and it was an interesting narrative structure. I love how Morty mentions she wasn't there when they lost their alien masks. I should have noticed that. Should. You want to develop an app? Rick's whole arc is tracking down someone who pooped on his toilet, one that is hidden in the woods, because he's a shy pooper. On the way, he does his typical Rick shtick by going to any length to figure out who this guy is. But when he meets him, he's surprised to find out that he wants Rick to kill him because he has not been fulfilled in life. Rick ends up sparing him and later on comes to find out he died from trying to live life to the fullest. The encounter sinks him into a drunken depression, him sitting on his toilet while surrounded by one thousands of himself telling him how worthless he is, which was originally intended for his dead friend. It's sad to see Rick in this state, silently grieving over a lost friend, while constantly reminded of how his existence is worthless. Morty's character development is subtle. After Jerry develops an app with Rick's intern, which he was explicitly told not to do, Morty doesn't take too kindly to Jerry's screw-ups. He tells his dad how disappointed he was in him and how he's embarrassed to be his son. It shows how much more he's becoming like Rick, more brutal and condescending with his speaking. Overall, a very enjoyable episode. Sanchez, you son of a bitch. In this episode, Rick and Morty attend HeistCon, a convention where people plan heist. Rick enlists the help of his new robot, Heistatron, for the ultimate heist. However, Heistatron double-crosses him as programmed by Rick for the sake of complexity. Rick, being a step ahead, had switched the brains with Randomtron, adding another layer of unpredictability. The episode humorously concludes by stating that Rick and Heistatron, or was it Randomtron, argued for two hours about who was ahead of whom, with Rick ultimately claiming victory. While the plot becomes intentionally convoluted, it remains a strong episode, albeit challenging to follow. After watching this, Ocean's movies might never be the same again. Okay, you matter. Me. In this episode, Rick delves into Bird Person's mind in an attempt to resurrect him. While it may not stand out in terms of serialization, it turned out to be one of the most enjoyable episodes of the season for me. The callbacks and Rick's journey through various memories, ultimately rekindling some form of friendship with Bird Person, were unexpected but very satisfying. Are you kidding? I'm hoping I can get to both of them, Rick! Anatomy Park is one of my favorite episodes of Rick and Morty. This episode follows Morty as he is shrunk and sent into the body of an old man to help Rick save him. I think the reason this episode stood out was because the plot had everything needed to make up a good story. Conflict, betrayal, a funny B-plot, an interesting scenery, unique characters, and a badass climax. Is that Mountain Dew in my quantum transport solution? Rick and Morty each go on their own solo adventures. Morty tries to gain his independence from Rick, but ends up realizing he's forcefully attached to this guy, Nick, through the small portal, making it a similar relationship to the one he was going against. Only in this instance, Nick goes completely rogue against Morty, and Rick does what he does best, goes to extreme lengths just to prove a point, reinforcing his title as the pettiest man in the universe. One of the funniest gags this episode has to be Jerry joining in to trash Rick's garage, but the literal first thing he smashes turns him into a puddle. Probably the episode in which the A and B storylines are best used as parallels for the different dynamics that make Rick and Morty such a successful show and capture the Simpsons-esque writing, which makes it appeal to such a broad audience. The A storyline, with Rick becoming Tiny Rick and going back to high school, provides all the superficial, one-dimensional jokes that are easy to digest and fuel the meme culture appealing to a wider and younger audience. The B storyline, which explores the hilarious and complicated marriage between Beth and Jerry, as beautiful and complex a relationship as any on TV, expands the much-loved lore that keeps longer-term and older viewers coming back for more. Who's ready for Rick's famous spaghetti? This Who's ready for Rick's famous spaghetti? Uh, delicious spaghetti, uh, only to later discover God, it's made no, from why, dead why, no, Initially, why I thought the opening was just you? a brief uh, gag a person, or a lead Rick. into the real plot due to its brevity. 
However, the show surprised me, turning it into a significant part of the storyline. The spaghetti is revealed to be made from people from another planet who committed suicide. Morty attempts to contribute his own ideas. And surprisingly, Rick behaves relatively nice in this episode, without much deception. There's a thought-provoking connection to the meat industry. And overall, it's a very creative episode that showcases the show's ability to turn ridiculous concepts into engaging narrative. It's the Rick Dan With Jerry and Beth away on a Titanic-themed vacation, both Rick and Summer host a party back at the house. Morty desperately tries to keep both parties under control, fearing reprisal from his parents. His brief attempt to spend time with Jessica results in the entire house being transported to an alternate dimension. The B story, centered around Jerry's enthusiasm for the Titanic-themed party and the twist that the ship doesn't sink, is perhaps better in concept than execution. It could have benefited from another beat to explain how Beth finds Jerry at its conclusion to save the day. Nonetheless, it serves its purpose in getting them away from the house. The main story with the house party is more engaging, introducing recurring characters like Squanch and Birdperson, voiced by Dan Harmon. It delivers more funny character beats and a touch of heart. You know how many flamingo dads I've seen. This is a rather odd episode. It features Rick meeting with his therapist who tells him to just ignore supervillains that come after him. It was nice to see Mr. Nimbus again. Jerry fights and humiliates a villain called Pissmaster and gets a magic orb to power a suit of his. He then becomes famous, and Rick decides he's gotten bored. He finds out Pissmaster has committed suicide and takes on his persona to impress Pissmaster's family. This episode actually provides a deep look into Rick's psyche, showing him wanting to do the right thing, even for people he doesn't know. It is one of the more vulgar episodes, especially with the villain's name. Nonetheless, it still has a lot of heart and delves into Jerry's psyche as well. The best part might have been when Jerry blew up the Hitler planet. Art. Why don't you rinse your dishes? The family learns of Rick's latest piece of alien tech, which animates their sleeping bodies and controls them to undertake preordained tasks. Naturally, the whole family soon wants in. Rick and Morty both use it to exercise and gain washboard abs. Beth learns the trumpet. Summer learns Spanish, and Jerry, being Jerry, turns his into a pen pal. But after determining that their lot in this arrangement isn't all it could be, the Knight family starts to rebel. Knight family is easily one of the best one-off episodes they've ever done. The animation and soundtrack in this episode are absolutely gorgeous and beyond belief. Rick and Morty have actually managed to be scary in this episode, and it works really well. There are several scenes from this episode that are absolutely horrifying in a good way. The episode concept is both nightmarishly twisted and absolutely brilliant at the exact same time. This episode isn't like classic Rick and Morty, it's better than it. This, motherfucker. this episode features the president getting help from Rick and Morty with various things and then realizing how annoying they are. This episode had great joke after great joke. The one that really made me laugh was when Rick and Morty were doing a Minecraft parody and Rick said, South Park already did it. As South Park is a show that's easy to animate, he then mentions how that show is either too fast or they're too slow. Probably a combination of both. As hilarious as this episode was, the action was great. We get to see the president fight Rick using all these cool weapons and agents. Beth spends the episode wondering if she's a clone and is therefore expendable. It ends with Jerry and Beth actually getting back together. Overall, I found this finale to be a satisfying conclusion to another fantastic season. Who do you think had more taken from them when you shot 20 cc's of liquid dream killer into my daughter? The main focus this time is the relationship between Rick and Jerry. When Rick takes Jerry on a pity adventure at Morty's request, the two actually start to bond until Rick lays into Jerry and Beth's relationship. Jerry, in a moment of weakness, agrees to be complicit in Rick's murder. Jerry soon comes to his senses, but a little too late, and the two have to fight their way out of it. Rick doesn't forgive Jerry easily, but Jerry makes a genuine apology and a promise to be better, which Rick actually respects. Back on Earth, Morty, Summer, and Beth are dealing with their storyline, which involves Summer growing to an abnormally large size. The main part of this I enjoyed was seeing Morty call Beth out on her worship of Rick. Her relationship with Summer makes a little progress, as does Rick and Jerry's. Overall, a great episode. 
Your sister's boss gave me a microscope that would have made me retard. This episode is once again hilarious, featuring a truly original and clever idea. People go to a pawn shop owned by the devil who gives away cursed items. Rick then finds a way to remove the curses, but keep the benefits of each item. It's amusing to hear Rick talk about all the ill effects of the items, creating an episode where you have no idea what will happen next. It's also nice to see Rick and Summer bond, although it's only near the end. The subplot with Morty and his dad is great too, addressing the controversial issue of Pluto not being a planet. It's entertaining to tackle an issue so many people debate about that doesn't have much importance in our lives. I guess his enemies more or less won at the end. In the scene after the credits, I kept thinking that it would have Rick and Summer beat up someone from the Westboro Baptist Church. They actually do. If I see you, did, I would be too, too, too good at haunting you. This episode opens by revealing the other Mortys died. Space Beth rescues them, and I will admit I was disappointed that this plot point was resolved quickly. However, it ended up still providing a great story. Rick's device accidentally teleports everyone back to their original universe, including Jerry, who is revealed to come from a mix-up back in Season 2. It turns out that in Morty's original universe, the Rick who killed Rick's wife in his original universe is native to this one. This episode advances the canon, gives us a little more context about Rick's past, references former episodes, includes funny Marvel references, sorry Vindicators, and most importantly is funny and has a cool sci-fi premise. We get a lot of great fourth wall jokes, great action, and great setup for future story. We also get some insight into Morty's original dimension, and the dialogue between Morty's father was powerful. I really sympathized with Rip Best Jerry in the Multiverse. Rip Best Jerry in the E. You like that? You want me to cut you three weeks earlier when you were alive? Rick and Morty land on a planet where all the citizens are allowed to commit crimes, including murder, without punishment for one night. The action scenes are probably what make this the most interesting. I am so glad I got to see Rick and Morty in the armor I see in the intro. I don't know why this planet has a world full of cat people. I mean, there's really no reason for them to look like that. I love when they break the fourth wall and mention the candy bar in the first act and how Morty's character has remained intact. Yeah, Morty will probably never get lucky. I like the satire with the bad writer, especially with, why don't we go back to three weeks ago when you're alive? Rick delivers the best lines and I love how he just zaps Morty to stop him. I had no idea those suits would come from that machine he sent for. I can't believe our tax dollars paid for this. The big premise of the episode is interdimensional cable. Rick hooks up the TV to receive television from every alternate timeline. Infinite TV. This means that they encounter some very strange programs. It leads to some of the series' funniest and most memorable gags. This already sets it up there among the funniest TV episodes, but it goes further. The family starts using the technology to glimpse what could have been in their lives. This is used for fascinating character development, competent even for a non-animation. It also leads to a great monologue from Morty about the consequences of a previous episode. Is where Rick and Morty sets itself above all the other sitcoms. It uses an intriguing sci-fi premise to create hilarious and memorable gags and push the characters into fascinating and compelling development. This is Earth Radio. This episode was hilarious. The whole thing was just awesome. The interesting story about them in a simulator and how they keep getting stuck in even more simulators was really interesting to watch. Also, the whole hungry for apples? Product idea with Morty's dad was the funniest thing ever. I also thought the aliens' personalities really worked well with the plot, and how they thought they were really smart, but weren't made Rick look way more awesome than before. I definitely enjoyed this episode. Why would I ever remerge with a pussy like you? In this episode, after a traumatic event, Rick and Morty both split into two different personas, the toxic and healthy versions of themselves. The toxic version contains every bad character trait Rick and Morty want to get rid of, while the healthy version contains what they see as their good traits. For Rick, this means that he splits off his alcoholism, vulgarity, narcissism, and insanely inflated ego as toxic, whereas Morty splits off his low self-worth, anxiety, depressive feelings, and self-detestation. What remains are the idealized versions Rick and Morty have of themselves. Rick is a meek but cold being, whereas Morty turns into a shallow, 
sleazy person. A case can be made that this episode shows us that our idealized version of ourselves is never able to obtain what we want them to. This happens to both Healthy Rick and Healthy Morty. Healthy Morty ultimately never gets the girl he so very desperately wanted, and Healthy Rick is so meek and devoid of ego that he is in no position anymore to protect himself from threats, let alone protect the world around him from them. I think the episode teaches an important lesson that has been made in other episodes. Though it sometimes seems like things could be better differently, such as a better life to be lived by an idealized version of ourselves, this simply does not exist. The good and bad both function in tandem and always move towards each other, being part of each other. I think that is the point of this episode, and it is delivered beautifully, is all I can say. Where are my testicles, Summer? They were removed. Where have they gone? Rick and Morty go down an endless, inception-like rabbit hole of dreams to convince Morty's math teacher to give Morty an A in class. Meanwhile, in the B-plot, a past invention of Rick is now being used on the family dog, which gives insane intelligence to the dog. Eventually, the dog finds out how to alter the invention to boost his intelligence, allowing him to build an army of intelligent dogs and basically take over the world. Now the family has to try to stop the dog. In conclusion, both plots are perfect. You can root for most of the protagonists in the situations they are in, and even the antagonists, Scary Terry and Snowball, become nice when the protagonists are kind to them. You sell weapons to killers for money? From Crombopolis Michael, an assassin very excited about killing, to a daycare service in space for all the Jerrys, this episode rocks. The Roy game that Morty plays at Blips and Chips is sublime a game in which you live another person's entire life. Jermaine Clement's fart character grows a little tiresome with the singing, but overall it's a very important piece of the entire plotline. Amazing. It was sad, happy, witty and solemnly nice with the music of Goodbye Moon Men. This episode delivers dark comedy in an upbeat fashion, as has been the norm for this great show. Oh, if I wanted to be sober, I wouldn't have gotten drunk. Rick, Morty, and Summer stumble upon a hive mind named Unity that Rick used to date. Summer objects to Unity's control over an alien planet's population. This episode is great because it is related to an unusual but interesting topic like free will. It presents you with the dilemma of being an autonomous human being and therefore living in a troublesome society or being controlled. In the case of the episode, being mind controlled and limited in the decisions you can make to reach collective and social prosperity. When all of this is added to the characteristic humor of Rick and Morty series, it is a delightful combination. Although the episode is, in some extent, exaggerated, it makes you question yourself about the implications and consequences of both paths. In a more general sense, this episode tells us about Rick's past, particularly about an unexplored side of Rick, his love life. If you care a little bit about Rick, it will feel like a gut punch. Every time I rewatch this episode, that particular scene gets more and more heart-wrenching. The music. The concept. Jerry with his lawnmower as comic relief. Oops, squid aliens just killed the decoy family. Killer squids are after the Smiths. But luckily, Rick created a decoy family. This episode was just fun, seeing different Ricks and families. Also, seeing them fight each other and wondering if they are real or were made. Mr. Hunt Me was also hilarious. And the end with him was also very funny. I loved this episode because of how insane it was. Overall, this episode was good. A very fun and unique episode. Sweetie, is your shirt on backwards? Six months after freezing time to clean up after the party, Rick, Morty, and Summer accidentally fracture space-time by creating quantum uncertainty. These two timelines can only exist for so long, and both realities' Ricks work at the same time to stitch it back together. After this fails, though, Rick decides on a different solution eliminating the other timeline altogether. A Rickle in Time is a perfect demonstration of what Rick and Morty is capable of, not only with its storytelling, but also its fast-paced and crazy humor. The opposing timelines are demonstrated with a split-screen effect, and the dialogue overlaps cleverly. For Summer and Morty, the wording changes, but for Rick, who's the most certain of them, it stays the same. Things are then kicked up another notch by the arrival of a fourth-dimensional being, if not the most hilarious episode the show has ever done. The B story involves Jerry and Beth accidentally hitting a deer, 
at which point Beth is desperate to use her veterinary skills to save it, despite a number of factors working against her. Again, it's fine, if not hilariously funny. It's nice to see a story where Jerry comes up with a plan that works out for him. Corey, do you have a death crystal in your pocket? No. Rick and Morty set out to an alien land to mine some death crystals, which show anyone who touches them their death. Morty sees one of his options, showing him dying as an old man in Jessica's arm. He then lets the crystal guide his decisions, leading to Rick's untimely death. Morty refuses to help with Rick's regeneration, and while Morty goes full Akira, Rick travels the multiverse, restoring in various forms and trying to get home. The breadth of ideas in this one episode alone is stunning. From Morty's actions based on the Death Crystal to the variety of Rick's returns and what happens there. Overall, it's a good, funny episode with no real story or serious theme to it. There's snakes in space! The episode starts with Rick and Morty in space, and Morty gets bitten by a space snake. They go to the snake planet to find a cure, but Morty sends a snake from Earth to replace it. They're then attacked by snakes in a Terminator parody, complete with a two-minute sequence of nothing but snakes hissing as the only dialogue. The whole snake story, including the 80s snake, the time travel to save Snake Lincoln, and the fight at Hitler's snake house, had me laughing. The end part was also funny with those guys who stopped time travelers beating up a caveman snake. Just an over-the-top funny episode. Grandpa, is this a scenario three? This episode takes the improv, skit-like formula of Ricksty Minutes and applies it to a new, more interesting idea. Morty has had adventures that were just too much for his mind to process, and Rick is wiping them from his mind, keeping them in a gallery hidden in the house. I really enjoyed when Morty figured out Rick had removed embarrassing Rick episodes like Losing at Checker, Classic Rick. Another great part is when Morty can hear what animals say and discovers squirrels are evil. It's implied that this was another reality that he and Rick had to abandon, so this does retcon something. The best scene of the episode was Summer casually asking, Is this a scenario 3? That and her actions upon deciding it was a 4. It's perfectly messed up. Funny, smart, and just an all-around good time. I love Morty, and I hope Morty loves me. At first, the episode appeared to be totally run-of-the-mill. Rick creates a love potion for Morty, which backfires and makes everyone crazy for him. I have seen that plot from so many shows like this. I resigned myself to another repetition of that same story, but then it went completely off the rails when Rick tried to fix the problem. Suddenly, we had a very strong story but it was the ending that cinched it for me. Rick and Morty get out of the situation in a way that is incredibly clever and oh so dark. I would say it's the Red Wedding of the Rick and Morty franchise, a true game changer and a shocker. Everybody in the galaxy tries to take over the galaxy. Clone Beth, or perhaps just Beth, returns from fighting intergalactic wars to get revenge on her creator. Just as Rick talks her down and they catch up, the Federation arrives, led by a returning Tammy as their leader, unable or unwilling to tell which Beth is a clone. Rick works to save them both, assisted by Morty and Summer, and an invisibility belt that they are both vying for. This episode is peppered with everything that's made Rick and Morty so captivating from the very beginning. We get the idiotic nonsense that fans can shout at McDonald's employees that makes us laugh. We get a well-thought-out story that has strings tied in from previous seasons. We get to see the man who defeated a god admit he's a horrible father and see right in front of us our anti-hero once again fall from grace. Overall, this episode is really great, with great humor, a great story, nice writing, and even awesome fight sequences. Not to mention a Pokemon reference, that's pretty cool. A strange horny ocean man is on my lawn. A sea landing puts Rick in contact with his nemesis, Mr. Nimbus. Meanwhile, with his life in peril, Morty shoots his shot with Jessica, who agrees to a date that evening. With Nimbus and Jessica due to come to the house on the same night, Rick ages some wine in a different dimension, where time moves much faster. When Morty goes to fetch the wine, he inadvertently starts a chain of events that lead to the creation of a dangerous, advanced culture. I think it's insane how easily Morty uses all the tech now that he's become a competent savage. He literally ruined thousands of generations of a family and sent them through an RPG phase and like 12 different sci-fi futuristic ages. The storyline there was great and pretty insane to think about. 
They also were riffing on Dune. Jessica became a much better character this episode, and what happened to her is just about the craziest thing that can ever happen to a person. Her dialogue at the end was great. It's very creative and has great build-up. I'm Mr. Meeseeks! Look at me! Morty chooses the next adventure and gets to lead, but if it's disappointing, he never complains again. Their quest involves a fantasy world, giants up a beanstalk, a criminal trial, and a horrible bathroom assault. However, before they leave, Rick introduces the family to an invention of his, the Meeseeks box. You press the button, a blue character appears and completes a task you ask him to undertake, then blinks out of existence. All is going well until Jerry sets them an impossible task. Here we see, perhaps for the first time, just how deeply Rick hides his love for his grandson. We see him put his ego on hold as Morty learns an important lesson about the real world, ironically from a fantastical one. It introduces a regular science fiction fantasy trope, that of a wish-granting genie, but taken to an extreme by the reality of that sort of situation. It's an easy idea to get your head around as an introduction to the Rick and Morty style. This episode is defining for Rick and Morty, and probably one of the best episodes of all for that reason. A completely new, intricate, complex, fun concept that no one else has ever thought about. Is the main story is amazingly well done. Rick creates an entire universe, and ultimately, a being evolves on a planet, in a sense, being the Rick of the universe. Or should I say, microverse. Zeep has all the class Rick doesn't give a crap about. Rick works in his daughter's garage, where Zeep has an entire tower dedicated to him. When they get stuck on Kyle's planet and they fight over the deer, Zeep's robot is shiny and has a golden ring around the parts to make it flashy. The whole universe within a universe concept to draw power just to power, Rick's car is hilarious. He uses an entire civilization as a battery. That is what Rick and Morty is all about. Rick going to extreme measures to do something that could probably be done in a less dramatic ultra sci-fi way, simply because he can. As for the B story, I thought this was also exceptionally well done. The melting ghost babies and the murder of two innocent people walking by just for the sake of senseless violence was awesome. The ship did a great job keeping me entertained while Rick and Morty went off on their adventure. I love this episode. Rick and Morty, 100 years. This episode starts with a fake out, making it seem like it was our Rick and Morty, but it was Evil Morty all along. Rick's working on finding Rick Prime, and then Evil Morty comes along. Morty accidentally unleashes a black goop, trapping them and other Ricks who had their Dianes killed by Rick Prime. After the Ricks kill each other, falsely thinking they'll be reunited with Diane. It's revealed Rick Prime used the Omega device to destroy all Dianes across Infinity. Wow, that is cold. I genuinely didn't think Rick C-137 would achieve his goal so quickly, defeating Prime Rick. The episode turned out quite differently than I'd imagined, but I like the concept presented in this episode. I love the ways Evil Morty demonstrated his power. He might be the best developed character in the seven season series. While some people found the resolution too quick and simple upon reflection, I realized my initial expectations were unfounded. The series, instead of conforming to fan service, often surprises us with completely different episodes and manages to combine two main storylines, twisting the narrative after a seemingly very bad start to a season. Putting aside everything, the writing brilliance once again proved itself with the takeover of Prime Rick's role and the triggering of a paradoxical sequence as both Ricks meet in each other's garages. The limitless potential of Evil Morty is truly magnificent. Personally, I believe the main story is not over and more plot twists are yet to come. If you've ever been sick of him, you've been evil too. The bit with anime Rick's two crows continues, but it's still abandoned after five minutes. The main thing is that Evil Morty makes his return. This has been building up for a long time. The most important part is Morty finding out Rick's memory. The best part is probably finding out that Rick's memory from a previous episode was, in fact, genuine. That means that Morty isn't blood-related to Rick after all, because there never was a blood-related Morty for Rick to begin with. It's certainly a lot to take in, and it would probably take a second viewing to truly understand it all. This had gorgeous animation, especially at the end with the Citadel being destroyed. 
Evil Morty goes off to another multiverse, presumably one without a Rick. This episode was amazing. It tricked us with the beginning, gave us so much we were asking for, and leaves us on an insane cliffhanger. The episode was just so amazing. Weddings are basically funerals with cake. The first half of the episode focuses on the wedding of Birdman and Summer's friend. This half was slow, but ended in a big, shocking sequence. Rick, Morty, and the family then find themselves on the run in the aftermath of the wedding. They are forced to search for a new home, leading to some very funny gags. The planet where everything is on a cob was one of my favorite concepts in the show. And that's saying something. Then it ends on a very sad and epic cliffhanger. It really fits with the way they've been developing the characters throughout the season. Rick and Morty manage to include feelings, comedy, drama in such a manner that you won't even notice what just hit you. I know I didn't. I was expecting a fun, nice ending, then in a blink of an eye, turned into the most emotional episode till now. Rick sacrificing himself in order to allow his family to live a normal life, only to find out that nothing will ever be the same as they expected. It was very impressive. I turn myself into a pickle, Morty! The setup for Pickle Rick is simple. Rick turns himself into a pickle to get out of family therapy and gets washed down into the sewers by a rainstorm. It's what the episode does with it that makes it special. Pickle Rick skips all the tedious buildup and gets right to the fun. Rick is a pickle laying waste to hundreds of lives. It works as a ludicrously over-the-top parody of cheesy action films from the 80s and 90s. To keep this episode from going overboard, the writers balanced out the insanity of the Pickle Rick storyline with the family's more grounded therapy session. There's even a surprisingly heartwarming part where Rick meets up with a guy named Jaguar, who is being forced to hunt Rick because his daughter is being held hostage. At first, it's implied Rick kills him, but he actually helps him out. There's even a scene after the credits where he comes back to save Rick and Morty from a villain who uses a giant piano to kill people. It's perfect. There's not much more to say. The scenario works. Dialogue, direction, acting, pacing, everything. I'd like to order one large phone with extra phones, please. Rick is arrested by the Council of Ricks following a spate of Ricks being murdered around the multiverse. As Rick has refused to join the Council, he is the lead suspect, but escapes with Morty and tries to find the real culprit. Meanwhile, Jerry and a somewhat less intelligent version of Rick form a bond. Again, this is a super funny, super clever episode, introducing us to the recurring Council of Ricks and furthering the idea that there's a Rick and Morty in each plane of existence. Everything is truly clicking now. The animation is great, the vocal performances are consistent, and the story is really ingenious. Fantastic the way they formed Evil Morty. It was shocking that it was him all along. Because we all think that Rick is the smartest man in the universe and can treat Mortys like trash because they have a higher power. Got a lot of friends and family to exterminate. In the cold open, we are immediately thrust into a relatively normal domestic scene where the familiar face of Uncle Steve is thanking the Smith family for their warm welcome over the past year. And of course, it's Rick who shatters the illusion by shooting Uncle Steve in the head and revealing that alien parasites from outer space have infiltrated their home and are posing as long-time companions. So Rick hurriedly locks down the home and establishes the ground rules and safeties. There are only six real people in this family. Him, Morty, Beth, Jerry, Summer, and of course, my favorite cast member, the lovable Meister Poopy Butthole. That kickstarts a whole range of alien parasites manifesting themselves in the most absurd and colorful characters and creatures in true Rick and Morty style. We have the totally insane lines and the most ridiculous characters. Overall, this is a masterful episode of Rick and Morty with a great twist at the end. But the pieces are for campaigning. Now is the time for action. This episode is amazing. We get to see all the different versions of Rick and Morty, with many different stories all going on and connecting. Seeing Cop Morty and how he is this old corrupted person, and how some Ricks just work dead-end jobs while others are rich. It also shows how people look down on Mortys. So much depth and story set into a 22-minute time span. It was spectacular. When it's finally revealed that Evil Morty is the president and his music starts playing, I literally got shivers. I was frozen. I was in disbelief that a show could do that to me in that short of a time. No words. Amazing show. 
How many sucks of bones this rat got? This episode opens with Rick and Morty cheating a bunch of guys out of gems by faking their death and falling into a pool of acid. It looks like the whole episode is going to be about this. It actually isn't as this plot point is dropped in a few minutes. Rick then gives Morty a machine that allows him to reverse time and relive his life, doing things better. He then finds out he killed alternate universe versions of himself by doing so. It gets only more complicated from there. It was one of the funniest and entertaining episodes from the series. It felt refreshing to have Morty in the spotlight learning a valuable lesson. Don't insult Rick. This episode made me laugh. It made me cry and told a movie-level quality story. I adore this show, and this episode is a prime example of why it is so amazing. Take gun, shoot me and stand up! Best episode ever. The episode starts with Rick enjoying a meal with his family at Shunny's, claiming he's gotten out of jail. But wait, it's a simulation. He's in jail, and they're just scanning his mind for information. Meanwhile, Earth has become a dictatorship. I love how this show excels in continuity. Summer finds the teleporter from her original version of Rick to break him out of jail. We even get to see Morty and Summer go back to Morty's original dimension. Rick manages to escape by transferring his consciousness into other bodies. The other Ricks destroy his original body, but Rick keeps escaping into everyone else's body. Best episode of all time. This episode blew my mind the first time I saw it, and I notice a new detail every time. Rick and Morty has a unique way of pulling its audience into a world that appears completely random, then fabricating a convoluted plot grounded in the apparent chaos. This episode is exactly what we all love about the show. Non-stop action, jokes and complex ethical and philosophical questions that our heroes are done with before you manage to wrap your head around what exactly just happened. The comedy was perfect. The story was entertaining without taking too long to explain how Rick managed to escape last episode's predicament. The animation was beautiful, and the music was entrancing. There's nothing not to love about this episode.